good evening to you. We have tonight an exceptional uh, subspeciality webinar, which is an ICU uh, webinar, intensive care webinar. Uh, this webinar is um, uh, uh, moderated by Dr. Ofa Ibrahim and Dr. Muhammad Hamdi. And uh, the chairperson of this webinar is uh, Professor Adil Hussein. And the uh, speakers, uh, Professor Adil Hussein, Dr. Sarwat Aisa, and Dr. Faisal. Uh, well, Dr. Ofa Ibrahim, we are so lucky for her tonight to be with us for the second time. Uh, she is one of the supporter of the MEGA online course. She's a consultant and anesthetist in uh, Mecca, and she is the head of the department of anesthesia in uh, King Faisal, uh, I believe, hospital in uh, Mecca. Uh, Dr. Rafa, we are so delighted that you are here tonight between us, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ahlan wa sahlan bil jami'ah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum jami'an. Hello, uh, welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure and honor to be with you again as a moderator for this webinar. Special appreciation and thanks for Dr. Saad Mahdi for inviting me for this webinar. Hoping that we get maximum benefit out of this webinar. Before we move forward, let me introduce myself again. Uh, I am Dr. Ofa Ibrahim, consultant anesthesia and ICU and pain medicine, head of anesthesia department in King Faisal Hospital, Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Before we start, here is a gentle reminder about our course. It is non-profit educational program for physician that held in collaboration with international speaker to share knowledge and clinical experience, update recommendation and guideline and to discuss with expertise the challenges that we might face in our practice. I'm happy to tell you that it, this course approved and recognized also by College of Anesthesiologists in Ireland, plus Egyptian Society of Anesthesiologists. And for all attendees who register in webinar, the certificate and approved CME hour will be sent to your email. On top of that, all our session will be recorded as a video and posted in YouTube channel, Mega Medical Association. Furthermore, in the Facebook page. Uh, please uh, feel free to type your question and inquiry in question box. We will do our best to accommodate and address your question at the end of uh, each session in the last 15 minutes. Now, I'm glad to introduce the second moderator, Prof. Mohammed Hamdi. He's from Anshan University, consultant anesthesiologist, and currently he's working in King, uh, King Abdullah Medical City, Mecca. He's a head of anesthesia department, and he was uh, my program director during my residency. I had a great experience to work with him. Uh, Dr. Hamdi will elaborate more about our course today uh, about ARDS related issue. Dr. Hamdi. Uh, okay, Dr. Sarwat, uh, introduce the first speaker. The, uh, the first speaker with us, Dr. Sarwat, he is a consultant anesthesia and intensive care from Egypt, and he is a former associate consultant in intensive care medicine in KMC, Mecca. And uh, he will be giving us the current and evolving standard of ventilatory management in ARDS. Dr. Sarwat, we are happy to have you and uh, Welcome again, and you can start. Mike is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ofa, for uh, this introduction. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Mahdi for the organization and invitation. And I am so delighted today to be uh, among my beloved family from KMC uh, again. And I would like to uh, thank all of them for uh, their precious time to be uh, with us today. Uh, so uh, I'm going to cover in uh, the next couple of minutes um, uh, the standards of ventilatory management in ERDS. Um, and um, I have nothing to disclose. And uh, uh, as outlined to this lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about the simply and briefly about the uh, definition and the epidemiology of ERDS. And uh, what should be my ventilatory approach for the patients uh, suffering from ARDS? And uh, uh, should I use high PEEP or uh, just low to moderate PEEP? 
and uh, uh, should I do recruitment to maneuver for my patients uh, who are uh, um, having refractory hypoxemia uh, with ERDS? And what if my patient uh, has refractory hypoxemia? What should uh, I do? Uh, I will try to highlight uh, these issues in a couple of minutes in an evidence-based approach. Uh, so uh, definition timeline of ERDS it started early uh, in 1967 by Dr. Ashpo and uh, his colleagues uh, in The Lancet, uh, this is uh, uh, 1967. Uh, actually, it was during the uh, Vietnam uh, War uh, because uh, they found a lot of trauma patients uh, suffering uh, with uh, uh, acute respiratory distress, hypoxemia. So uh, that was the first time for the beep to be used, actually. And uh, um, it is a wide range of manifestations, as you can see here, severe dyspnea, tachypnea, cyanosis, and decreased pulmonary compliance, it is a very wide uh, range of uh, uh, manifestations. Uh, then later on, uh, Dr. Um, Mori. Uh, Dr. Mori is one of the landmark names in the field of ERDS. Uh, in 1988, uh, and uh, by the way, guys, Dr. Mori is uh, uh, buzzed away during the first wave of COVID-19 uh, uh, from, uh, uh, bronchopneumonia and the ARDS, and he's a pulmonary critical care consultant, and who's the one invented the Mori score for uh, uh, determining the patients uh, at the bedside who are using it to determine uh, which patient uh, uh, eligible for ECMO. And um, uh, he published this four points uh, scoring system that is uh, uh, specifying or uh, defining the ERDS in terms of oxygenation, B, respiratory system compliance, and chest X-ray involvement. And then later on, uh, we have in 1994, uh, the consensus definition between the European Society of uh, Intensive Care Medicine and the American Thoracic Society and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And we stayed with this definition for almost 16 years. And this definition well known to all of us, it is uh, three criteria of acute onset of bilateral infiltrates in the chest X-ray and uh, acute lung injury defined by BF ratio below 300. And if the BF ratio below 200, this is uh, defining the ERDS. And the exclusion of cardiogenic cause uh, of pulmonary edema uh, guided by the pulmonary artery catheter, pulmonary artery which is pressure below 19 millimeter of mercury. We stayed with this definition for almost uh, 16 years till uh, the year 2012, that is a release of Berlin definition, uh, which uh, was having some differences from the previous consensus definition. Uh, and we are gonna highlight this uh, in the next couple of uh, slides. Uh, so uh, they changed some, uh, some how here the respiratory uh, failure and the refractory hypoxemia uh, should be an acute onset, not uh, uh, acute onset, but rather than it is defined by the time frame of one week. So it should be within one week and bilateral infiltrates or obesities on the chest X-ray or CT, which are not fully explained by effusions, uh, lobar or lung collapse or nodules. And the respiratory failure not fully explained by cardiac uh, failure. And uh, here they added an objective assessment tool, which is the echocardiography. And they graded the uh, severe ERDS. Uh, and th this is well known to all of us because we are using this uh, uh, definition nowadays in defining our patients who have ERDS or not. Uh, so it changes from 1994 uh, in this definition that the term acute lung injury was abandoned, no more used, and the measurement of BF ratio was changed to require a specific minimum amount of BEEP, that is BEEP of five or more, which was not uh, uh, the case in the previous consensus definition, 1994, and three categories of ERDS, mild, moderate, severe, based on the BF ratio, and also the radiographic criteria we really changed a bit to improve the inter uh, reliability and no more pulmonary uh, capillary wood pressure use. 
Um, in 2017, that was the birthday of ARDS, 50 years uh, of studies and practice in the field of ARDS. And I can quote here Dr. Gattanoni uh, words that the baby lung uh, became an adult. That this means 50 years of practice and experience in ARDS. Uh, uh, that means uh, we, we should understand more and apply more standards of care for, for our patients suffering from ERDS. Uh, so, but physiologically, uh, the, the ER, this is not that simple pulmonary edema, uh, which resolved quickly over a very short time, uh, rather than it is a pathophysiological process involving the alveolar capillary membrane and the alveoli and lung tissues that's characterized by diffuse alveolar damage and interstitial and alveolar edema due to either direct or indirect insult uh, th that leads to uh, inflammation of the lung and alveolar capillary membrane with subsequent activation of inflammatory mediators and cells that leads more to more damage in the alveolar capillary membrane and increased its permeability with subsequent influx of protein-rich edema that floods the alveoli and cause more damage and uh, uh, also surfactant dysfunction. That this, this phases of uh, histopathological changes that occur in the lung takes time and it's defined to be two or three phases of exudative phase uh, and uh, then uh, um, inflammatory phase and uh, the fibroblurifurative phase. So it is not just simple pulmonary edema. Uh, in order to understand this more, um, the Palm Critical Care published the, this uh, article in 2018 uh, that uh, considered a failure of Berlin definition uh, in fairness. Uh, is, it, uh, is my patient suffer from uh, ERDS or uh, it is just pseudo ERDS? That's why they labeled it as the eleogenist. As you can see here, the CT uh, is showing a picture of bilateral lingobastis you can see or infiltrates this is what we are uh, in reality seeing in ER these patients and the scenario is uh, this is a young woman presented to genius general hospital and uh, um, i don't know if you know genius general hospital or not but actually there is uh, no hospital called uh, genius general hospital it is just a, a virtual uh, and non-realistic hospital uh, that's created the, by the website just for the ethical issues to make them uh, um, uh, uh, more uh, um, uh, ethically they can just represent the scenarios uh, of the diseases without any ethical dilemmas. So it is uh, not an actual uh, or real uh, hostel, it is just virtual hostel. So the patients presented in this hostel was a week of one week of shortness of breath, which is progressive and fatigue. Uh, she, she was found to have diffuse pulmonary infiltrates due to viral infection. In the ICU, she was treated with high flow nasal cannula, but eventually she tired out and required intubation. Uh, prior to intubation, she was saturating to 87% to 100% of IO2 at 60 liters per minute flow, uh, which is definitely she is uh, suffering from hypoxemia. Uh, then after intubation, they connected here uh, on the ventilator to the ABRV mode, and over a few hours, her lungs gradually recruited and she was weaned down to 30% of IO2. That is in a couple of hours. And the BF ratio on the ABRV was 475. So she's out of ERDS by this criteria of BF ratio and the improvement, the rapid improvement. Uh, later on, due to some concerns regarding hypotension, she was transitioned to a conventional uh, low tidal volume ventilation with a PEEP of 12 centimeter of water. Uh, her oxygenation deteriorated and she required an increase from 30 to 50% of I2 uh, on conventional ventilation. Uh, then the BF ratio came down to 166. Um, uh, she recovered very rapidly and was extubated over uh, uh, 36 hours uh, later. Over the next few days, she was weaned off uh, oxygen entirely and walked out of the hospital on room air. 
Um, I believe that uh, this scenario is uh, uh, not uncommon scenario, and we are facing this uh, in our daily practice in the intensive care. And uh, I am pretty sure that uh, if I asked you, did this woman have ERDS? Um, I'm pretty sure that your answer will be no. She didn't have ERDS by definition because she improved over uh, 36 hours. She is totally free of the ventilator and she's on room air. Her oxygenation is much dramatically improved only within 36 days, uh, which is not the real scenario in ERDS. Uh, basically, although she met the all criteria of ERDS by Berlin definition, the acute onset, the bilateral infiltrates and the CT scan and the BF ratio of 166, isn't it? So according to Berlin definition, she had moderate to severe ERDS based on the BF ratio in conventional mode uh, that, that was in BBOF 12, which is quite high. However, she didn't meet the definition of ERDS while she was in ABRV. With EBRV and recruitment of her alveoli, the BF ratio came up to 475. And her overall clinical course uh, was excellent recovery and weaning of oxygen inconsistent with the natural history of ERDS. Uh, that's why uh, the true ERDS uh, might be defined as a histological uh, diagnosis involving diffuse alveolar damage uh, throughout the lungs that's characterized by uh, inflammatory process involving the alveolar capillary membrane and those patients in uh, uh, reality behaving like severe hypoxemia which doesn't disappear following the recruitment even we are trying to recruit the alveoli but by all means and sometimes you are facing a very challenging scenario that the patient hypoxemia is not improved and impaired lung compliance, which was not the case in, in our patient, and increased the, the space uh, with subsequent inefficiency to uh, clearance. A slow recovery over a period of several days, often with residual fibrosis, and that was not the scenario in our patient. So that came to the, uh, um, uh, the literature uh, that there is some limitations to Berlin definition. Yes, there is and uh, it doesn't include the underlying etiology and lacks a direct measure of the lung injury. And the use of vasopressors at the time of diagnosis of ERDS, which is significantly correlated with the morbidity, is not counted in the uh, Berlin definition. And it's still using the X-ray, which of course is, uh, uh, if correlated with the CT, has uh, a poor uh, correlation. Uh, that's why, uh, one of the investigators uh, um, uh, investigated and uh, it's published in 2012 and then later on you have tons of articles with and against the uh, permanent definition in terms of pros and cons. Uh, so um, uh, this author in 2013 checked the uh, sensitivity and the specificity of this permanent definition uh, and uh, it was a study uh, of autopsies of the 356 patients who were diagnosed as ERDS and behaved like ERDS based on Berlin definition. Then they concluded that the sensitivity uh, according to the histopathological findings of these autopsies from those patients who suffered ERDS earlier, it is 89% and the specificity of 63%. Uh, coming to the prevalence and uh, mortality, uh, that uh, it is, yes, it's quite uh, prevalent, specifically during the pandemics, and we have seen this during uh, the COVID, for example, still we are uh, managing the patients with ERDS, and most of ICU admissions of COVID are related to ERDS, so it is a, a quite prevalent, with uh, a mortality rate of 30 to 40 percent, and in some studies up to 47 percent. Uh, if I came to the epidemiology, I cannot buzz this without mentioning the lung safe trial. It is the largest trial to date in the field of epidemiological uh, studies uh, of the uh, patterns of care, mortality of patients with ERDS. And uh, I was one of the uh, ESKIM trial group uh, uh, who are involved in this trial, and it is um, uh, a trial, International Multicenter 1, 
uh, included 50 countries, 635 hostels, and the, uh, we screened 29,000 of patients uh, with ERDS, uh, from which eligible uh, around 3,000 uh, patients. Um, and uh, uh, the period prevalence of ERDS was around 10% of ICU admissions. And the ERDS appeared to be under-recognized and under-treated worldwide and associated with high mortality. And looking at here from the results of the lung sift trial that the, the duration of invasive mechanical ventilation, the median time is eight days. So it is not a matter of one day or two days or six hours. Whenever you are facing this scenario and your patient is rapidly improving over a couple of hours, one day, two days, three days, it is not an ERDS. It is probably a simple cardiogenic pulmonary edema or something else. But it, ERDS is something different, which requires the ventilation over days and the median duration of ICU stay according to the lung sift trial is around 10 days. And you can see here the uh, survival is around 66%. So the mortality in the lung sift trial around 44%. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of the uh, uh, management of ERDS and uh, the clinical evidence uh, for the current state of art uh, in the ERDS management, we have to mention the landmark trials. And the landmark trials here are related to the ERDS network. And I am pretty sure that all of, all of you guys know the ERDS network and we use this uh, uh, protocols of ERDS network during uh, the last pandemic. Um, one of them is the ARMA trial and uh, we'll highlight the ARMA trial earlier before the ARMA to the Karma trial and some trials here for the uh, steroid use and alveoli uh, for the use of the PEEP, high PEEP fact for uh, flow therapy and some other trials in phase two. So starting with, sorry. <clears throat> so starting with the, the most important trial in the field of management uh, of ERDS, which is the ARMA trial. Uh, ARMA trial uh, was done or conducted over uh, almost three years multi-center uh, trial and it's randomized controlled trial published in uh, uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it is a very simple uh, distribution or allocation of the patient's two arms. One arm is low tidal volume, which is 6 ml per kg predicted good weight, and keeping the plateau pressure of 30 or below, versus what was traditionally done that time, which is the higher tidal volume, that's 10 to 12 ml per kg, without limiting the, uh, the plateau pressure. So the, uh, the, the, the randomization was either this arm with uh, low tidal volume, 6 ml per kg, with uh, a limited beep to 30 or below, versus 12 ml per kg. And it is actually the star of the trials in this field because they stopped it at the fourth interim analysis due to efficacy. As you can see here, uh, this is a proportion of survival. And you, this is the 6 ml per kg versus the 12 ml per kg. And it is apparently significantly uh, here, you can see the significant difference between the 6 ml per kg and the 12 ml per kg in terms of survival. So uh, looking at the B value here in terms of uh, mortality, that the 6 ml per kg carries lower mortality than the 12 ml per kg. Not only this, but the ventilator three days and also the non-pulmonary organ dysfunction. So the number pulmonary organ dysfunction also was significantly uh, lower in the 6 ml per kg. So the conclusion was clear to be with the 6 ml per kg limiting the, the plateau pressure to 30 or below. That's what we are calling lung protective ventilatory strategy. Uh, but there is some trade-offs with 6 mlg, uh, ml per kg, which is the oxygenation. Looking at this curve, here is the BF ratio representing the oxygenation 
Uh, and you can see here, this is the 12 ml per kg versus six ml per kg. And you can see that the oxygenation is much better here uh, for almost one week uh, than the, the patients uh, with 12 ml, uh, with six ml per kg. But later on, after one week, almost there is no difference. So it is not the oxygenation uh, that makes the difference in mortality, rather than something else. Looking at here, uh, this is a proportion of patients alive, and you can see the 6 ml per kg versus 12 ml per kg. So it is not the oxygenation which saved the lives of the patients with ERDS, rather than something else, which is the low tidal volume and limiting the plateau pressure to 30 or below 30 ml uh, centimeter of water that saved uh, lives. And why was that? Uh, to the concept of uh, heterogeneity of uh, the distribution of ERDS in, in the lungs here, you can see here in the upper parts, uh, uh, the normal lung tissue, which is defined by Gattanoni as uh, the baby lung, which is the functional uh, uh, baby lung, we can say. And this is the area of consolidation, which represents the recruitable part of the alveoli. And here's the area or partially aerated areas. Here, non aerated at all, totally collapsed lung and the totally non functioning uh, parts of the lung, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so, wh whenever you are trying to recruit this area, which is the recruitable part of the alveoli, whenever you are trying to open up this alveoli and recruit this alveoli for better oxygenation of your patients, you are going to hyperinflate these areas of the normal lung tissue and causing what we are calling the ILI or ventilator induced lung injury. And this is subsequently inducing a cascade of inflammatory mediators and cytokines, which injures the healthy tissue of the lung. And also it is poured in the circulation, injuring the other organs. That's why it is lung protective strategy, not only protection of the lung tissue, but also it is protective to the other organs. Uh, so this is what we are calling the biotrauma. It is not only the ventilator-induced lung injury, but also the biotrauma. And uh, the b or uh, uh, the patient self-inflicted lung injury that will happen in the early phase of ERDS that you are leaving your patient spontaneously breathing. And is hyperventilating, hyperinflating the alveoli, and this gonna release more inflammatory mediators, cytokines injuring the healthy tissue of the lung, and the other organs causing uh, biotrauma. And I think we have seen this during uh, the COVID pandemic that the patients are hyperventilating in the early phases of ERDS, causing more damage to the lung tissues. I hope so far it's clear uh, this point. And here, this is uh, the famous protocol of, uh, of uh, ERDS network. And I'm pretty sure that all of you guys know this protocol well. Uh, better than me, and I would just like to highlight here that uh, whenever you have a patient uh, uh, with ERDS and you are managing this patient, please set your goals, put your targets, set your goals, write down your targets, inform your nurse or uh, respiratory therapist that our oxygenation target is like this, our pH target is like this, our plateau pressure tidal volume, you have to set your target in order to apply the lung protective strategy. Don't connect the patient to the ventilator and go without doing this, please. Uh, so you have a look here at the oxygenation goal, as we have mentioned that oxygenation didn't save lives. It is something else, saving the lives rather than the oxygenation. That's why the bo 2 here uh, is 55 to 80 millimeter of mercury, which is almost 7.3, 7.5 kBa as the lowest uh, level of oxygen. And saturation of 88 to 94, 92 sometimes are more than enough to oxygenate the patient to maintain the oxygenation of the vital organs. Because sometimes our nurses are getting panic just be because the VO2 is 7.5 or 8, which is fine with these patients. And also sit your plateau 
pressure not to exceed the 30. And look at the pH here. You can allow permissive hypercarbia. Oxygenation is priority than the hypercarbia. So allow permissive hypercarbia to your patients unless it's contraindicated. And the pH target here is 7.3, not necessarily to be normal and down to 7.15 as the ER, this protocol, you can just adjust the rate or the IA ratio, whatever feasible for you at the bedside. Coming to the PEEP, uh, should I set my PEEP to a high level or low level? And I'm gonna highlight here some of the trials mentioned the uh, uh, high PEEP versus uh, lower PEEP. One of them is the alveoli trial and it's published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2004. Uh, it is a multi-center randomized controlled trial uh, comparing the patients who uh, are treated uh, with higher PEEP versus uh, lower PEEP. Um, and it stopped early at the second and term analysis because of the utility. As you can see here, there is no significant difference at all between uh, the higher beep and lower beep or uh, the ventilator three days. You can see here, no significant difference in all the outcomes studied, either uh, the mortality or the, uh, 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 the breathing without assistance, the ventilator three days and all. So later in the love the trial, uh, published in JAMA in 2008. This is a lung open ventilation study. Also, they compared, the, it is a multi-center, also randomized controlled trial comparing uh, uh, the higher beep versus uh, the lower beep. Looking at here that they use the lung protective strategy and they used here also tidal volume of 6 ml per kg, but they allowed the people to, uh, to reach up to 40. And also it is a negative trial here as there is no significant difference, probability of survival, as there is no difference between the higher beep versus the lower beep uh, and all cause mortality also, there was no difference at all. So uh, uh, the, it is a negative uh, uh, conclusion, negative trial uh, that it didn't affect the mortality, uh, but the open lung improved the hypoxemia and the use of rescue uh, uh, therapies. Uh, so it didn't affect the mortality, but it decreased the use of other rescue therapies and the rescue therapies, uh, we are gonna highlight this in the next couple of uh, minutes. Uh, then later on the express trial between 2002 and 2005 and is published in the JAMA in 2008. Uh, it is also a multi-center trial compared uh, uh, the higher beep uh, with a target below two of 2830 centimeter of water that has limited hyperinflation. Uh, so they kept the lung protective strategy uh, versus the patients with moderate PEEP strategy. And you can see here that there is no difference in patients with ERDS, uh, sorry, uh, no difference in mortality in the patients with ERDS, no difference here also in mortality in the patients uh, uh, with acute lung injury. Uh, but only uh, the ventilator three days here, you can see uh, this is one of the, probably this is the only uh, statistically significant difference here, that breathing goes out assistance. This is the overall outcome, and this is uh, the outcome for the patients with ERDS. So they concluded that the strategy of setting beep aimed to increasing alveolar recruitment while limiting hyperinflation. They kept the plateau pressure at the level of 20 to 30 centimeter of water. So they limited the hyperinflation. They applied the lung protective strategy in this trial. That didn't reduce mortality, but reduced the duration of mechanical ventilation and organ failure. So um, later on, there is a, a secondary analysis of both trials, which is the LOVED trial and the EXPRESS trial. And fortunately, they found that there is some uh, mortality benefit with the secondary analysis. That initiated another uh, investigators to do the meta-analysis that is uh, published in the New England, in the JAMA in 2010. Uh, it is a meta-analysis of the three trials that studied the BEEB, high BEEB versus low BEEB in ER these patients, the alveoli, loves and the express trial. Uh, and uh, they found here uh, that there is a mortality benefit in this meta-analysis here, uh, the proportion 
of the survival. Uh, so you can see here, this is the patients recruited to the higher PEEP uh, level versus the patients with lower PEEP and the PEEP value is reaching the statistical significance. So there is a mortality benefit. And this is the patients with ERDS, patients without ERDS, it's a bit confusing terminology here, uh, but this is the patients with acute lung injury. The time, uh, Berlin definition was not released yet. So uh, these patients with acute lung injury, so they found that in patients with ER, this, there is a mortality benefit to use a higher P versus lower B, but not the scenario in cases of acute uh, lung injury. Uh, so I would like to highlight this issue also uh, when you are ventilating your patients with uh, ERDS that um, the swinging pressure or the distending pressure uh, is the transpulmonary pressure. And the transpulmonary pressure uh, is the difference between uh, the intraalveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure. And this is the true distending pressure of the lung. And uh, you can see here in a spontaneously breathing patients uh, that it is around 10 centimeter of water here. And this is intubated patients uh, ventilated while passive. And also it is not that high here. This is difference between the intra-alveolar pressure and the intra-pleural pressure. What I would like to highlight here is difference here between both uh, uh, patients here that this patient intubated, ventilated with forceful inspiratory effort that the intra-alveolar pressure is getting high and the intra-pleural pressure more negative and the sum of these 10 minus minus 15, that is the intrapleural pressure, which is basically negative here. So the transpulmonary pressure is around 25 centimeter of water. Look at this obese guy that his intrapleural pressure is much higher than the normal patient that's transmitted intrapleural pressure from the increased uh, fat in the abdomen and increased intrapleural uh, pressure. Uh, so uh, you can see here that in spite of this obese patient has uh, intra-alveolar pressure up to 30 compared to the other uh, normal individuals, uh, but his intra-pleural pressure also is getting higher. Uh, so the end result of this, the transpulmonary pressure is not increased. That's why in such patients, obese patients, in spite of having a high airway pressure, the pressure is, the transpulmonary pressure is not injurious to their lungs. So we can accept a higher PEEP levels and also a higher, sometimes a higher plateau pressure, which is safe in such scenarios. This is what I want to highlight here. Uh, because in this slide, as you can see, you might be confronted with such scenario that this morbid obese or let's say sober morbid obese patients who develop bronch pneumonia and ERDS and you are in a situation to ventilate this patient because of ERDS. How to sit P in such a patient? What are expecting from the previous slide uh, that this patient with uh, low chest wall compliance and low lung compliance because of excessive fat deposition here and increased the intra-abdominal pressure that is encroaching the diaphragm, embarrassing, embarrassing his breathing and increasing the transpulmonary, uh, the intrapleural pressure. So we are expecting the higher airway pressure. And according to what I just mentioned in the previous slide that we can accept higher B levels and even higher safe plateau pressure despite a higher airway pressure because the transpulmonary pressure, the distending pressure is lower. And how to sit beep in such patient? The answer is here from New England Journal of Medicine uh, in this article, uh, in this article uh, published in uh, 2008 that mechanical ventilation just guided by esophageal pressure in acute lung injury. And you can see here, this is the beep level and here is the conventional uh, beep uh, uh, or conventional treatment with uh, the traditional beep. And here setting the beep according to the esophageal pressure and the esophageal pressure reflects the intrapleural pressure. Uh, 
So you can see this is a significant difference between both. And still, it is safe to use the higher BEEP in such patients rather than the conventional treatment. And it is actually associated with better oxygenation. You can see the BF ratio in the patients uh, uh, who set the BEEP uh, guided by the esophageal pressure versus the patients who uh, are uh, uh, treated with the conventional beep, and also the respiratory uh, system compliance was better in these patients uh, when guided by the esophageal pressure. Uh, would it affect the mortality? Yes, it did. You can see here that the mortality uh, rate at 28 between both groups was significantly different in favor of the beep that set based on the esophageal pressure. But you can see that it is hardly reaching the statistical significance because the sample size was low. Later on, there's another trial studied the same issue, which is the uh, EB22 trial that's published last year uh, in the JAMA. And the clinical question was the same. Uh, does titrating be with the use of esophageal balloon to estimate pleural pressure improve the outcome compared with empirical high BB phyto strategy in patients with moderate to severe ERDS? Unfortunately, no. The, the answer is no. The, it is a negative trial. According to this study, the survival probability, there is no significant difference. Now, the recruitment maneuvers. One of the um, trials studied the recruitment maneuvers in the ERDS published in 2017 in JAMA is the ART trial, open lung ventilation versus ERDS network protocol. It is an RCT, uh, multi-center, uh, moderate to severe ERDS patients recruited, and uh, the intervention of 500 patients versus the uh, control group, which is conventional ventilation, which is the lung protective uh, strategy. As you can see here, the intervention is that they recruited uh, the patients using the beep gradually increased by almost 10 centimeters of water over two minutes, one to two minutes, every one to two minutes. This is the phase of hemodynamic preconditioning. Uh, till they reached a plateau pressure of 40 centimeters of water almost for 10 breath, then gradually decreasing the beep over the next few breath gradually uh, till they reach uh, uh, the beep, uh, uh, which didn't uh, cause de recruitment of the alveoli and the kept the oxygenation to the target. Uh, they depended here on the compliance of the lung. As long as uh, the compliance of the lung is significantly improving, they are going to increase the beep more and more till they reach a level of no improvement or no significant improvement in the compliance, and that's it. They are keeping it for a few seconds, then they decreasing again the beep uh, gradually. And uh, what you can see here that uh, there is a significant difference, which is 0.04, yes. And here's the mortality, and here's the lung recruitment. So it is not only a negative trial, but detrimental trial. We found there is a mortality increase in the patients who are recruited with this procedure. So lung recruitment in this trial was detrimental uh, uh, compared to uh, uh, the low beep strategy. Uh, but you can see here that the statistical significance is a bit fragile and still there is subgroup of patients might get benefit from open lung ventilation strategy and recruitment. And it is the art to determine which group of patients who will get benefit from recruitment maneuver, but given the harm uh, and the art trial uh, and increase in the mortality uh, uh, of the patients recruited in this trial, you have to be very cautious in using the recruitment maneuver. The FARLAB trial, this is the Australian multicenter uh, trial also, uh, they studied the recruitment maneuver versus the standard treatment in the patients with moderate to uh, severe ERDS, it is an RCT, uh, and it is published, uh, even they stopped the recruitment of patients of ERDS in this trial, because the publication of ART trial with detrimental outcome uh, was released uh, before FARLAB. 
Uh, in the far left trial, it is also a multi-center trial uh, between 2012 and 2017. And they included the moderate to severe ER, these patients. And you can see they used the staircase recruitment maneuver or the stepwise approach. Uh, you can see here uh, in this uh, graph that uh, they uh, did a stepwise increase in uh, the beep uh, almost here up to 20, then to uh, 25. Uh, every two minutes, gradually, they, they increase the beep till uh, they reach the level of 40, then decreased it to 25, then 2.5 centimeter of water almost every three minutes till they reach a fixed number of 15 centimeter of water of beep. Then another cycle of recruitment. You can see here in this uh, graph, and it is a very famous graph, well known to all of us, this is a pressure volume uh, loop. Uh, it is one of the most important curves to be understood when we are talking about lung compliance and uh, uh, ERBS. Uh, you can see here that this is a limb of inspiration and it is sigmoidal in shape with a steep part. And the steep part here is the best or the most favorable part for the lung compliance at which increase in the pressure will significantly increase the volume and the alveoli will be significantly recruited here. So this is the best area of lung compliance. And the other part is uh, the expiratory uh, part is almost hyperbolic and it is a curve showing the, the phenomena of hysteresis. And you can see here, uh, what I would like to highlight here that uh, the, the, the most lower part of the steep part is the lower inflection point, below which, all the alveoli will be derecruited, as you can see here, atelectus, what we are calling atelectotrauma. That's why the beneficial beep in such patients should be almost two centimeter of water above the lower inflection point to prevent the atelectotrauma and to have the lung to your patient in this area with uh, uh, the most favorable part for lung compliance. And you can see here, the, uh, the upper point is the upper inflection point. And the upper inflection point determining the end of the favorable part of lung compliance, and after which there will be hyperinflation of the alveoli, causing ventilator-induced lung injury and barotrauma. So this is the part you need. And this curve actually is present in some ventilators like Hamilton, uh, we are using it to uh, measure the optimal beep uh, for our patients if you have the availability uh, of this in your uh, uh, unit. Uh, so the outcome, uh, primary outcome of the far lab was the ventilator three days and the secondary outcome was the mortality and some other stuff, no significant difference. So again, it is a negative trial in terms of the primary outcome and the secondary outcome. So we have the ART trial and the far lab trial. So the conclusion is clear. It is a negative trial, but also it reduced the use of rescue therapies for hypoxemia. So still you can select your patients. If you have nothing to do more, you have to cautiously select your patient for recruitment maneuver and observe him closely while you are doing the recruitment maneuver, otherwise, it is associated with high mortality. To highlight this also, um, the driving pressure and the driving pressure uh, was first described by Amato uh, in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, driving pressure and survival in ERDS. And the driving pressure guys is the difference between uh, simply the difference between the plateau pressure and the beep and it is not an RCT, but it is an association study. So uh, Amato and his colleagues analyzed the data from 356 uh, uh, and uh, 3,560 patients with previous uh, nine randomized studies with uh, uh, ERDS. And they found that uh, increase in one a standard deviation, which is equivalent to seven centimeter of water was associated with increase the mortality. To understand this, 
look at these curves, which is, uh, are very important to understand the, the, the driving pressure. Uh, here it is matched to the beep, so they kept the beep, as you can see here, the beep is constant at the level of 10. But the airway pressure is, this is the airway pressure, the airway pressure is gradually increased here. And they calculated the delta B, which is the difference between the plateau pressure and the beep. And they correlated with the mortality. You can see here that statistically significant difference in the mortality when uh, uh, the driving pressure is increasing, the mortality is gonna increase. Look at the second one, it is matched for the delta B. So they increase the B to match the increase in the plateau pressure and to decrease the gap, which is the delta B, and they found the mortality, it is constant. Looking at here, you can see that it is matched to the plateau pressure. So the plateau pressure is kept constant. This means that here you, it is a pressure controlled because it cannot control the airway pressure except if it is a controlled mode of ventilation. So it is a controlled pressure controlled mode. They control the pressure here to this level and they increase the beep to decrease the gap. They found that the mortality is significantly de decreased. So it is not the beep, it is not the plateau pressure, it is something else which is the driving the pressure. It is the difference, the delta B, the difference between the plateau pressure and the beep is associated with improved mortality. Again, to look at this curve, if you are ventilating your patient with a pressure controlled mode and you are fixing the plateau pressure, it is beneficial to increase the beep in order to decrease the, the, the gap, in order to decrease the driving pressure to a certain level, which is the magic number decreasing the mortality. And that is called beneficial recruitment. This is what we are calling beneficial recruitment. So the conclusion is clear, decrease in Delta B, the driving pressure owing to change in ventilator setting where strongly increase uh, the survival. And what is this magic number which improved the survival? And the answer here in the same article in the New England Journal of Medicine, it is somewhere between 15 and uh, 18. It is here in this study 18 and some other uh, trials it is 15. So your driving pressure should not exceed the 15 or 18. This is the magic number uh, improved the mortality in ER test patients. Um, uh, so again, uh, one of the rescue therapies that we are using in our these patients, uh, the oscillator. And what is the evidence behind the oscillator? Uh, the two large randomized controlled trials are the OSCAR trial and the oscillator trial. I'm going to highlight this. So um, the OSCAR trial uh, is a randomized controlled trial published in 2013 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, they used here uh, the oscillator for uh, ventilatory management of uh, ARDS patients with BF ratio uh, below 200 uh, in UK. And you can see here that there is a negative study, no mortality difference. Here's a proportion of survival. There is no mortality uh, difference. Uh, okay, there's a couple of minutes I'm finishing the slide. Uh, the oscillate, uh, oscillate trial, uh, again, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. Uh, it stopped early because of increased mortality. You can see here that this is a probability of survival. And this is a control group with usual mechanical ventilation or traditional ventilation versus the oscillation, the os high frequency. And this is significant difference between both in uh, favor of the control group. So using the oscillator, again, increases the mortality. And uh, uh, you guys keep in your mind that they use the oscillator as a mode of ventilation for ER this patient, not as a rescue therapy. So it is not studied as a rescue therapy, but it's studied as a ventilation uh, uh, management strategy. Uh, so if you have a patient with refractory hypoxemia, these are uh, your choices here, either to use nitric oxide, proning, and, uh, uh, or ECMO, or ABRV mode, 
uh, or the oscillator as a rescue therapy if you have nothing to do. We are gonna highlight this in the next lectures uh, in this day or the next day. Uh, what if you uh, have done everything and your patient still hypoxemic, you have to think in other causes because it is uh, proven that in 20% uh, of patients, they have patent forum in oval with VQ mismatch and shunting and also RV dysfunction in 25% uh, uh, of patients. And this is about the EBRV and this study, the single uh, center study uh, that is using the EBRV for ARDS patients in trauma. Uh, and you can see here, that is no difference and it is uh, concluded as it is safe as a lung protective strategy for managing these patients. Uh, uh, and again, this is another study uh, published later on also in 2017 about the ABRV uh, and acute uh, uh, respiratory distress syndrome uh, and uh, the primary outcome was the ventilator free days uh, and the secondary outcome was the mortality and the oxygenation. And you can see here that there is a, a mortality benefit ventilator free days uh, was also uh, better in the patients uh, ventilated with ABRV and the number of uh, uh, ventilator free days and uh, uh, length of stay as well. So they compared that, uh, it, uh, compared those conventional uh, lung uh, protective strategy, the early application of EBRV in patients with ERDS was associated with better oxygenation and respiratory system compliance, lower blood pressure, less sedation requirements, more ventilator free days at 20, 28 days and shorter duration of ICU stay. Uh, but again, it's a single center study uh, and uh, we need larger randomized trials to study this. And uh, the last thing to mention here uh, uh, that's published in CCM journal uh, in this study, that is a, a retrospective analysis uh, of nine years experience, uh, multi-center uh, of managing ARDs that they found that uh, and the units with, uh, they studied the uh, ARDS management in low volume, intermediate volume and large volume uh, units. And they found that uh, managing the ERDS patients in the units with large volume of patients had an impact on the outcome that is improved the mortality, it's linear relationship with the mortality if managing the patients in high volume. That means what? That means uh, if you have the expertise and you have the facilities, the outcome is much better uh, than managing those patients in the lower volume uh, units. And this is a severity match treatment uh, ranging uh, uh, between mild, moderate, and severe ERDS. Uh, based on the BF ratio, you can see here the protective lung strategy is applied or through. You can use a low moderate PEEP, non-invasive ventilation in the mild cases might be tried, and the higher PEEP than the neuromuscular blockers, pruning, high frequency oscillator as a rescue therapy. If you have nothing to do, you can use the ECOR or the ECMO. And this is the same but in uh, algorithmic approach because of the time, I'm gonna uh, 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 stop here at the home messages uh, that you have to consider the pros and cons of Berlin definition, treat the underlying cause, lung protective strategy, please set your goals. And if you have a patient with refractory hypoxemia, I think we answered this. And the most important uh, thing is uh, 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 to remember always, put in your mind the most important factor in ensuring safe ventilatory support is you, yourself, because the ventilator might be a life-saving or a killer to your patient, and thank you. I'm sorry for being late. Dr. Hamdi. <clears throat> Salam alaikum. Can you hear me? Alaikum <laughs> salam. Thank you, Dr. Sarwat. It was a very nice presentation. MashaAllah, <laughs> a lot of information with this uh, lecture. So um, we have um, a lot of questions here. <laughs> if you can share some if questions. Time allows because uh, I think I took a uh, long time. Uh, so, Ta as you uh, like. 
I'm ready to answer any questions. It's only two or three questions, please, because um, okay. we are running behind the time. To save time, okay. Uh, so one question, Dr. Sarawat, uh, you mentioned that low tidal volume, uh, it's uh, not improved the oxygenation, it's something else. Yes. So uh, our colleague asking, what is this something else? Yes. <laughs> you didn't mention. This is what I'm trying to the... highlight, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamdi. Uh, this is what I'm trying to highlight uh, all over the lecture, that the lung protective strategy is not the oxygenation. It is the tidal volume, low tidal volume, and keeping the plateau pressure uh, uh, within the limit of 30, keeping the driving pressure at the level of 15, that is associated with better outcome in terms of mortality. The, these, the parameters are associated with improved survival. It is not the oxygenation. That's why we are keeping the oxygenation as a target. Saturation of 88, 94 is more than enough, and BO2 55 to 80 millimeter of mercury or 7.5 kb is more than enough for such patients. I hope that's clear. Good. Yes, it's clear. Thank you. Uh, another question about the for morbid obese patient. You mentioned also if we use a high PEEP, the, yes. the main the main issue is about uh, that transpulmonary um, pressure. Trans pressure. Yes. Uh, but did we have a specific uh, yeah, any number for this high beep? Um, do you have something? Uh, I, I cannot say a specific number because it depends on the patient. No one size fits all in such scenario. You have to yes. tailor the beep based on your patient. Look at the plateau pressure, keep it within safe limits. In the morbidly obese patient, what I want to highlight here that because of the transpulmonary pressure remains low in spite of high airway pressure, a higher levels, a slightly higher level of plateau pressure is not injurious to those patient's lungs because the true distending pressure, transpulmonary pressure remains lower than the other normal patients. So I cannot see a specific number. You have to tailor this to your patients at the bedside. I cannot hear you, Dr. Hamdi. Hello? He's, he's muting himself. Yes, yes. Now it's okay? Yes. Yes, Yes. okay. So it will be the last question about the driving pressure. As yes. you mentioned, Dr. Salat, it was very good information about this. Yes. But what, uh, we need to decrease this driving pressure and it will improve the survival, yes? <clears throat> yes. Uh, yes, and you mentioned almost between <clears throat> 15 to 18, yes? Yes. So if we consider like this, uh, if we keep the plateau pressure around 30 as a recommendation. Yes. So the recommended B to, to get this driving pressure, I think it will be almost 15 mm -hmm. to 20, something like this. So if we, we, we make a difference between the PEEP and the, the plateau, we can get this uh, recommended driving pressure. Is it right? Yeah, exactly. It is different simply. Driving pressure is a relationship between the tidal volume and the respiratory system compliance back to the physiology. But however, for uh, simplicity and over steps of, uh, I didn't mention that because of complexity of the equations, uh, it is difference between simply the plateau pressure and B. You can calculate it simply at the yes. side with the ventilator, look at the plateau pressure of your patient, look at the B, uh, subtract the B from the plateau pressure, it will give you uh, the driving the pressure. Good, good. Thank you so much, Dr. Salawat. Again, it was very illustrative and very concentrated one. Thank you for you. It was a very great one.